At the dawn of time, beneath the clouds of Africa's mysterious mountains of the moon, thousands of years before recorded history, an ancient race of pygmy hunters lived in the misty twilight of a great rainforest. Perhaps more than any other known people, the pygmies blended naturally with their environment, the humid rainforest of tropical Africa. Judged hostile by modern man, yet considered by some to have been the birthplace of mankind itself. What if today, deep in the forest, we were to find a surviving group of living fossils, pygmies completely untouched by the outside world? To anyone searching the vastness of the Aturi forest for a hunting band of Mbuti pygmies such as this, it is not enough to spend days walking the forest, exposed to all the elements that even African natives do not willingly endure. The pygmies themselves must want to be found. If they don't, no human being except another pygmy could ever find them. That's how they've survived, their ancient lifestyle unchanged for unknown centuries. If such a pygmy were to be transported back in time to his world, say, 6,000 years ago, he would not be aware of any difference around him. He would eat the same food, have his hut built of the same materials, hunt with the same weapons, dance to the forest with the same dances. Hunting animals and gathering wild foods, the nomadic Mbuti wander through the forest at will, building a new camp every five or six weeks when food becomes scarce around an old camp. In their humid equatorial home, they wear only a wisp of cloth made from tree bark, sometimes painted with interesting designs to please the eye. They can see no good reason for leaving the forest that so adequately provides all the food and shelter they need, a place where politics, crime, and war are unknown. An Mbuti pygmy prepares for the hunt. His weapon, the bow and arrow. His target, the monkey. Considered small game, the monkey is not usually hunted with bone or metal-tipped arrows. Instead, simple wooden arrows are treated with a deadly poison made from certain insects and plants, enough to kill a monkey within minutes. Although a regular part of the pygmy diet, the colobus monkey is in no danger of extinction. The Mbuti don't own a single gun between them. Killing only for food, their hunting methods have remained unchanged for centuries. Hunting with nets is a technique used by the Mbuti pygmies in Central Africa. Using only materials of the forest, each family makes and maintains a net. From time to time, all the nets in the community are tied end to end and strung out through the forest in a maximum effort to catch game. While the men tend the nets, the women beat the forest, driving the animals ahead of them into the net. The animals they hope to catch are the forest antelopes, hiding somewhere among the trees. Extremely shy and acutely sensitive to danger, all nearby animals are immediately aware of the pygmy's presence. They listen, trying to locate the exact place the danger is coming from. 
But the danger is constantly moving as the beaters begin to close in, trapping the animals between them and the net. The animals that panic run blindly into the net and die. The meat they provide to be shared by all. Death comes quickly for those animals unlucky enough to be trapped. The hunt continues with the steady approach of the beaters. Sometimes, not too often, when there's a surplus of meat, a tiny imbiloco antelope will be captured and kept as a pet. But its future is as uncertain as the next hunt. The gathering, bartering, and preparing of food occupies much time in the life of a pygmy woman. It's only when the chores are done that she takes the time to do things just for herself. Mother's milk is often used in preparing the cosmetic that all pygmy women apply to each other's faces. The milk is mixed with a wild forest fruit, the juice of which turns black on contact with the milk. Water would affect the same chemical reaction, but even in the Ituri forest, water is not always immediately available. The juice, now turned black with the action of the milk, is strained off into an earthen pot, and since mirrors are unknown in the forest, a friend applies the makeup. Trained since childhood, each pygmy woman deftly draws lines with the sure precision of an artist. Every woman has her own idea of what looks best, and no two designs are alike. But there are few complaints, for having no mirrors, nobody really knows just how they look. While the men may be expert hunters and providers of meat, the women are skilled at an endless variety of jobs about the camp. Making a sleeping mat out of bongongo leaves is done with such effortless skill that it almost appears easy. But a lifetime of practice lies behind such casual endeavors. Such sleeping mats are waterproof against the perpetually damp floor of the forest. When one wears out, a new one is made. Everybody has slept on such a mat all their lives and will probably die on one. Many children are born on mongongo leaves. In pygmy society, grown-ups frequently play together with children. It's one way of passing along customs and knowledge from one generation to the next. In the hoop dance, mothers teach their daughters gestures and body movements, symbolizing events and occurrences in adult life. And besides, it's a pleasant way of passing the hours when the day's work is done. Some of the body movements might be frowned upon in another society, but the dance that the young girls perform reflects a complete innocence of mind in doing what comes naturally. For a pygmy mother to openly search her daughter's head for lice is as natural as any other sign of affection. Rather, it would be considered unnatural not to remove the lice if they are there. From about the age of two years, little boys are already learning the most important activity in a pygmy community, hunting. Butterflies are not exactly a dangerous animal, but one must start somewhere. Hunting frogs is not much more ambitious, but it all leads to the day when, as young men, the accuracy of their arrows will mean food or hunger for the camp. There are no chiefs among the pygmies. The most respected men are the best hunters. Extreme humidity allows frogs to live permanently out of water and lay their eggs on land. Some frogs never make it. The most poisonous snake in the Ituri forest, the horned viper. Its slow mode of traveling on its ribs belies a terrifying speed and deadliness for there is no snake that strikes faster or kills quicker than the horned viper. 
From frogs to snakes is a natural step in the training of a young pygmy hunter. And besides, the snake makes better eating. Cut off its poisonous head, and the meat is almost considered a delicacy. But first, the snake must be killed before it can be eaten. Among pygmy hunters, there is none more renowned for skill and bravery than the one they call Sangu. Living deep in the forest with his wife and young son, his only weapon a spear, Sangu is known for the number of elephants he has killed single-handedly. Many pygmies are in turn killed by the larger animals, and they say that an elephant will one day get Sangu. But hunting is his job, a job he takes great pride in doing well. The daily rainstorm is due to strike any minute now. Time to take shelter in the fragile huts that seem light enough to blow away. To experience a tropical storm, sheltered only by a few leaves and sticks, is to know a feeling of total insecurity, unless one is born a pygmy. Yet the temporary hut of the nomadic Mbuti is entirely functional. With a fire burning inside, it can be as snug and warm as a hut built of brick and mortar. Meat is stored in baskets hanging from the wall, and a piece can be cooked any time on the fire which is always burning. Because of their great hunting skill, pygmies enjoy more protein in their diet than most people in Africa. In the Ituri forest, Family togetherness is not just an empty phrase, at least among the Mbuti. Children are not isolated in separate rooms, and nobody can ever be truly lonely. Smoldering fires, collective body heat, and warm, humid nights make bedclothes unnecessary and unknown in the Ituri. Just a sleeping mat of green mongongo leaves to cover the damp earth. Total saturation. Frequent rains and tropical heat combine to produce a humidity of up to 100%. Trees continue to drip water long after the rain has stopped. Organized devastation. A forest that took millions of years to evolve, chopped down in days to make way for the villagers' gardens and more houses made of mud and sticks. For generations, the pygmies have come to the Negro villages for metal tips for their arrows, iron knives, and spear blades. The secrets of metal working with bellows and forge are jealously guarded and never shared by the village blacksmith. On their part, the expert pygmy hunters offer meat from the forest, something the villagers value highly. And so the tools, or weapons, are offered in exchange for a share of the hunter's kill. Ultimately, the villagers may have the final advantage. For most of all, the pygmy desires the bananas and other cultivated foods that only the villagers can provide. And somewhere along the way, the gentle little hunters seem to have accepted the villagers as their overlords and owners. On special occasions, many pygmies will come out of the forest to gather at the village of their owners. News of an impending elephant hunt will bring the biggest crowd of all. And when pygmies get together, one thing is almost certain to happen. When the villagers want to kill an elephant, they hand out spears to the pygmies and tell them, go, kill an elephant. This not only increases the chances of a successful hunt, but it's considered much safer, at least for the villagers. The voluble instructions from the villagers to the pygmies could be reduced to just a few simple words. Here are the spears. Now go and kill an elephant, a big elephant. And don't forget, the tusks are for the chief, so they must be big too. The villagers are not especially tall people, yet they tower over the pygmies like giants. But the pygmies are not unduly impressed. They'll kill an elephant all right, but only when they're ready. For a few days after visiting the villages, the pygmy diet is often supplemented with such cultivated delicacies as the banana, which they carry back into the forest with them. In its various forms, they will roast, boil, and take raw this favorite fruit, eating it as many as three times a day when available. The pygmies like to eat such things, but never grow them in the forest. That would mean settling permanently in the same place, 
cutting down trees, making plantations. A complete change in lifestyle for the nomadic pygmies who love their shady home as it is. Tradition holds that the pygmies originated in the primeval forest, but they always lived there. Certainly, their lives are so interwoven with the ecosystem of their beautiful home that they are as much a part of it as the antelope, the insects, or the fish in the stream. Unmet streams of the purest water flow gently among the trees towards the nearest river. Streams that only the Mbuti have seen and named. Their forest sanctuary is not taken for granted by the pygmies. They praise and thank it for what it provides. They light fires in its honor, sing in its praise, and think of it in almost deified terms. Until now, inhabited only by scattered groups of the little people, the Ituri is one of the unpolluted natural wonders still left on Earth. The making of cloth from tree bark is a satisfying, creative task for a pygmy. Using only the inner layer of bark from a certain tree, the piece is separated and the rougher outer bark discarded. About an hour's work is necessary with a traditional elephant tusk hammer to pound the bark into a soft cloth, a process that greatly increases the original size of the piece. The creative satisfaction comes in the final painting of the bark cloth with vegetable dyes, usually in geometric designs. Every embuti is his or her own person, and as with face painting, each design is different and must not conform to a tribal pattern. Human pressures and emotional stress are not excessive in the rainforest. An artist's materials cost precisely nothing, and time in the Ituri is not measured in dollars. The hunter Sangu is one of the group given spears by the villagers. But something of a loner, Sangu doesn't like to hunt in a group, especially one after the dangerous elephant. He'll go along with his friends until the serious hunting begins, then leave the group to hunt alone. <laughs> Preparation for the hunt includes the blacking of faces. The Mbuti say that when the elephant sees them among the shadows, it will think that they are chimpanzees, and so ignore them. Of all the preparations to kill an elephant, none is more enjoyed by the hunters than the making and drinking of a ceremonial drink called Liko. It's made from the kola nut, with an added stimulant in the form of certain green berries from the forest. All the hunters given spears by the villagers have collected at a single camp in the forest, including the inscrutable Sango. The kola nut contains caffeine and once provided the stimulant used in modern soft drinks. Mixed with the green berries, the effect on Sango and his friends will be much the same as exceedingly strong coffee. But unlike nervous coffee addicts elsewhere, the pygmies wait patiently for their brew, knowing it will come only when it's ready. Cups are unknown in a nomadic Mbuti camp. Instead, leaves are passed around to be used for drinking the cola concoction. And so a bond of friendship is strengthened between a group of hunters, just as it might have been thousands of years ago in the same primeval forest. There will be a personal triumph or tragedy for the man who thrusts the first spear into the elephant. But everyone knows that if the hunt goes well, the meat will be shared by all. The hunters leave camp without farewells or fanfare. In his adult life, each man has been on more hunts than he can remember. Some have killed a fierce forest buffalo, Others have accounted for the Akapi and Bongo. Only two of them have previously killed an elephant. One of them, Sangu, the quiet one. 
It has been three years since anyone in their part of the forest has killed one of these giants. And then the hunter himself was killed horribly by the wounded beast before it ran off to die from its spear wound. happiest to be moving through their beloved forest, the hunters break into a steady run that will take them faster towards the elephant. They carry smoldering logs of wood so that they'll have fire wherever they stop for the night, about 50 kilometers deeper into the forest. One of the more persistent dangers of the forest, the ferocious army ants. On the march, day and night, they swarm over every living thing in their path, attacking a man as quickly as they would another insect. A particularly juicy meal is traveling nearby, blind and unaware of danger. A worm, longer than some species of snakes, long enough to be a swallowing problem for the average worm-eating bird. The hunters jog after the elephants. Their wives and children follow in their tracks, carrying with them everything they own. The huts they left behind, they have abandoned forever, to be reclaimed by the forest. Somewhere ahead before nightfall, they'll stop and build an entirely new camp out of the virgin forest. They don't expect to see their men until the next day, for they know the elephants are deep in the forest. As always, the women carry burning logs with them to the new camp apparently unable or unwilling to make fire without them. In a world they say is shrinking fast, the space age, a group of nomadic pygmy women are making a camp exactly as they did thousands of years ago. The very first pole of a new hut, a family home to be built in a couple of hours. Total cost, absolutely nothing. Building permit? It hasn't been invented yet. Purchase of land? Walk in any direction for a day and take your pick. A private stream, a river bank, a hilltop. It's all free for the taking so far, until time and the outside world catch up with the Mbuti pygmies. No one knows how long the Mbuti will ignore a government order to abandon their nomadic life of freedom and settle permanently near the road. It is perhaps unfortunate that nobody has thought to ask the pygmies what they want to do. Because their hands and arms are usually busy carrying loads or building huts, Mbuti women have developed an ability to pick things up with their toes in the Ituri forest, there's no waiting around when there's a job to be done. In modern times, the geodesic dome has been developed and acclaimed as a structure combining the desirable properties of the tetrahedron and the sphere. Yet many, many years before these words were invented, the pygmies had developed their own geodesic dome. They do not give it fancy names, nor hope that everybody will admire it. A pygmy hut is purely functional. It can withstand the forces of a tropical storm and keep out the chilling, damp air of the night. About every five weeks, it is abandoned and a new one built of fresh materials, complete with change and landscaping of full-grown trees and exotic shrubs. It's all there in return for a few hours' work. It's fortunate that the mongongo plant grows profusely in the forest. Its enormous leaf is the most widely used thing that the pygmies know, covering for the floors of huts, sleeping mats, food containers, drinking cups, and variations on these uses too numerous to mention. The final leaf of a job that looks more simple than it is. There now, see what a good wife I am.
From time to time, it is apparent that all is not perfect in the life of the Mbuti. But with their usual flair for survival, a medicine is prepared, this time from the bark of a certain vine. When applied to an open wound, it promotes healing because it is a powerful germicide and inhibits infection. How many plants and substances the Mbuti tried before finding one that worked shall never be known. How many other effective medical cures they have discovered in their vast botanical wonderland is a matter of conjecture. One of the rarest, most exotic foods in the world is found in a termite hill. The locals call it malengi. A white fungus mass will sometimes grow on the fecal wood and leaves that have passed through the alimentary canal of the termites, creating a symbiotic relationship between the termite and the fungus. The termites eat the fungus, and this reuse of their feces is important in their feeding cycle. The Mbuti love to eat it when they can, but not every termite hill contains this stringy white fungus that tastes like mushroom, only better. The mushroom, in its many varieties, is a regular part of the pygmy diet. Some mushrooms are tiny and smaller than a fingernail. Others are large enough to feed a family. Somewhere in their misty beginnings, the Mbuti have found which mushrooms were edible and which were poisonous. Even without hunting, the pygmy would not go hungry. The Ituri offers a multitude of edible things to those who know its secrets. Some vines are poisonous, some make good medicine, and others have leaves good to eat. As nomads, the Mbuti do not grow crops of any kind. Instead, they have learned to eat the things that grow wild in the forest. To a pygmy woman, a certain plant indicates the presence of edible roots. When the hunting is poor, a family can live indefinitely on roots, nuts, berries, wild fruits, and mushrooms. Essentially, all human life in the Ituri evolves around the pygmy camp, and everyone must eventually return there. The women arrive with enormous loads of rain-soaked firewood, each load heavier than the woman herself. A day's work of gathering completed, and a rest well earned. A woman smokes a pipe of marijuana and relaxes with her woman friends. She would as soon smoke a common cigarette, but it's a luxury she could not afford, even if available. Traditionally, the Mbuti woman wears a knife in her belt, but it's not for any warlike purpose. She keeps it at hand for 101 jobs in the forest and about the camp. Now it's time to make baskets to carry the meat of the elephant that they are confident their husbands will kill. Each woman will carry her own weight in meat and perhaps more. Much of the meat will go to the villagers in return for bananas and other cultivated crops. But first, an elephant has to die. The man closest to killing an elephant at this point in time is Sangu. Accompanied only by his friend Gabandu, he has found tracks only minutes old. He tells his companion to stay behind while he goes in alone to check the elephant's size. Another fresh track. It's a large bull. Sangu compares the size of his own foot with that of the elephant. But right now, it's one of those noisy flying machines that Sangu has never seen on the ground. He has been told by the villagers that men fly inside the machines. Sometimes he wonders what the forest would look like from such a height. But this is a view that he'll probably never see. A giant cauliflower of a forest so dense that there are places where sunlight has not reached the ground for hundreds of years. Frightened by the strange sound, the bull decides to leave, and Sangu, he decides to follow. 
The pygmy's ability to run for great distances through the forest makes him one of the deadliest hunters ever known. Few animals, even the elephant, can outdistance him once he picks his target. If the elephant ahead has not yet sensed Sangu's presence, the other animals along the way have. But some instinct tells them when they are not the hunted one, and tension doesn't give way to panic. The elephant is mortally wounded, and Sangu is very much alive. He does not expect to find the elephant dead until at least the next day, but he'll follow as far as he can before darkness comes. Tonight, the hunters will sleep deep in the forest, far from their wives and families. <laughs> That night, the hunters talk about the wounded elephant. Was the wound deep? Did it hit a vital place? Is the beast already dead? Or is it waiting with a terrible vengeance to kill them when they catch up? Sangu thinks the elephant will be dead when they find it. But his friend Gabandu doesn't think so, and mentions the name of Gabenyi, who was killed by such an elephant. Sangu was right. With his friend Gabandu, they find the elephant quite dead. It's a full-grown bull with fine tusks, and Sangu was pleased, but like Gabandu, he is also awed. The jubilation will come later, after exorcism of the animal's powerful spirit accomplished by cutting off the tip of the elephant's trunk. Possession of the dead elephant by the hunters is further established by removing the tail. To have this member is at once proof of ownership and a special symbol of victory. Gabandu does the honors using the sharp edge of his spear. He gives the tail to Sangu. Only now does Sangu allow himself the emotions of victory. Single-handedly, armed only with a spear, he tackled the giant elephant and survived.
Bailey's fascination with the elephant trunk continues even in death. Just as the use of fire makes the Mbuti different from all other inhabitants of the forest, the elephant's trunk distinguishes it from all other animals. They know that an elephant kills with its trunk, and they delight now in touching this lethal weapon with impunity, a prehensile nose with its tip cut off. When all the excitement is over, one man will be chosen to take the elephant's tail back to the camp, so that the people will know that an elephant has been killed. From among the hunters, it was Gabando who was chosen to carry the elephant's tail back to camp. He doesn't have to say anything. The tail is the message, and the proof. He holds it high for all to see. An elephant provides more meat than a hundred antelopes. Even with the villagers taking their share, the Mbuti in this part of the forest will be eating elephant meat for months to come. They clap elbows pygmy fashion. The occasion surely calls for a celebration dance, a spontaneous bubbling over of Mbuti good humor, a dance with drums and bamboo flutes unique to the pygmies of the rainforest. When the pygmies dance, they believe that the forest hears their music and listens to their song. They thank the forest for the meat of the elephant and for not taking the life of an Mbuti hunter in return. For unknown centuries, the pygmy was the only human being in the immensity of the rainforest. His dance, the only dance. His song, the only song, with words. But cutting up a full-grown bull elephant is serious business. By the next day, everybody with even the remotest claim to the meat has found their way to the carcass. The crowd includes those villagers who provided the spears and who claim to own Sangu and his hunter friends, and for that matter, their families too. But at a time like this, the villagers forget their pride and work side by side with the pygmies. There is little disagreement, for the pygmies are a remarkably peaceful people. But there is an urgent mood, for while custom decrees that certain important persons are entitled to selected parts of the elephant, the age-old axiom that possession is nine-tenths of the law applies also in the Ituri forest. For the most part, the women keep out of the bloody struggle. They serve the purpose of guarding the ever-growing piles of meat thrown to them by their husbands. Before the tons of meat can be carried away, it must be smoke dried to preserve it and to lighten its weight for the journey. Fires and meat racks are easily made from an abundance of wood. It takes about a day or two to smoke dry the meat, and when it's ready, it may not look particularly appetizing, but it has lost more than half its weight. Nothing is wasted, not even the bone marrow. Using an axe provided by the villagers, a pygmy breaks open a huge leg bone of the elephant. Inside, the marrow is soft, raw, and ready to eat. It is also apparently delicious. The word spreads, and soon pieces of raw marrow are being eaten like candies. And what of Sangu, the man who made it all happen? Sangu, the hunter of elephants, provider of food for his family and a hundred other people. Perhaps he thinks of the grueling three days march with little food, or of what might have happened if the elephant had turned on him. Again, a spontaneous dance, this time to honor Sangu and his hunter friends, to pay tribute to their hunting skill, to say thanks for the meat of the elephant. With dance and song, the Mbuti commune with their forest, the forest that they've loved and venerated since the misty beginnings of time. 
The forest is our mother and father, the pygmies say. It gives us everything we need, food, shelter, warmth. We are the children of the forest. When it dies, we die. The meat is dry now, and everyone carries a heavy load. The place where the elephant died is left far behind to the flies and the ants. Ahead lies a full day's march, following trails only the Mbuti know. The pygmy culture existed for unknown centuries before the Magna Carta was signed in 1215. It flourished through events that took place yesterday in the Mbuti timescale. The so-called discovery of America, the conquest and destruction of the Aztecs and the Incas. Yet today, the Mbuti nomad is aware that his life of freedom and harmony with nature is threatened by outside forces. He is instructed to leave the forest and make a permanent home at the edge of the nearest road. When the last pygmy does, an entire people will have lost their identity, and the forest will be empty of humanity and laughter for the first time in thousands of years. And so one day, soon, in the name of progress, the pygmies will be gone, and there will be none like them to take their place. In the great forest that may have been the birthplace of mankind itself, the empty, decaying huts of a few scattered camps will be all that remains, and the fire of the pygmies will be extinguished forever. <laughs>